something to say. Hello everybody and welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, and today, yeah, we're going to talk about the finale for season two of Star Trek Discovery, because I've committed to this process. Such Sweet Sorrow Part 2 was a thing that happened, and it was a mess of insane kowtowing to fans of other series that it did uh, it, it was a letdown in every possible way with some amazing fight scenes some beautiful acting and <laughs> some really really cool stuff so I, I i really can't talk about this show at all without spoilers because i want to jump right to the end and then maybe talk about some other stuff that happened throughout the episode and whatnot so if you have yet to see star trek discovery such sweet sorrow part two and you do not want to be spoiled for episode 14 yeah check out now spoilers are incoming in five four three two one what in the name of the great bird of the galaxy were they thinking when they wrote this episode First of all, it definitely proved that the last couple episodes were fo were filler and were just there because they didn't know what else to do. This episode was set up to be such an interesting, powerful episode that in true Star Trek Discovery fashion, tripped over its own feet right at the finish line to make me not really care about season three though let's be honest it's a star trek series so i'm definitely going to watch season three but so let, let's talk about the end so after burnham goes through the thingy and takes discovery with her we are treated to a long montage of number one and Pike and Spock in front of a Federation review board or a Starfleet review board. And they're asked all kinds of questions about what happened and why it happened and blah, 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 blah. And it ends with basically Spock saying, let's just make it a law that we never discuss discovery or any of its crew ever again punishable by treason which is why apparently in a series that had absolutely no care or concern for continuity especially in the original series and if you don't believe me on that spock was originally called a vulcanian before he was called a vulcan and yeah <sighs> Yeah, they, they felt that they had to explain to us why we've never heard of the Spore Drive, why we've never heard about Discovery before, why we've never heard about this fight with Control, by simply having Spock recommend that it be made punishable by, <laughs> punishable by treason for anyone to mention it. And that's it. That's the reason. It, not because the Spore Drive was destroying a parallel universe that was a huge plot line in this season. And so, like, with the Warp Drive that had to be refactored because it was damaging subspace, they just can't use it because it's bad. And that's why the technology went obsolete. Yeah, no. It's not because we're going to go into... Um, more of the uh, animated series 
continuity and allow more of that to be canon where they actually had holodecks on the Enterprise in the animated series and the ability to produce holograms all over the place in the animated series and that that just never factored into the original series. No, we're, we're not going to do that. We're just going to say that we're going to pull all that out because it helped control do bad things. And yeah, I, I saw one person do a review where they said that the f- season finale of Star Trek Discovery turned the original series from a utopia to a dystopia. And I wouldn't go that far. I, I think that's way overselling the impact of the ending. But the way they chose to actually end the series, the season, because we're getting a third season. Oh my goodness. I mean, it just, it didn't work. It, it, it made me feel like they were just caving to pressure from an outspoken group of fans that they thought they could appease with this really weird tacked on ending. And what they need to realize is those people are never going to be happy. They're not. There's look, I'm an old school Trek fan. I remember watching the original series when I was a little kid in reruns. I remember watching the next gen when it launched deep space nine, all of it. Right. I've been a fan for a very long time. And I hang out with a lot of star Trek fans. And the one thing that I know that I know that I know that I know about star Trek fans is there's a certain contingent who will It's like Doctor Who fandom, right? Whatever Star Trek is the one that you fell in love with, all other Star Trek is inferior to it. It's kind of like why old timers like me think about Peter, you know, Peter Davidson and um, Tom Baker and almost always bring them up as our favorite doctors. But younger people, depending on when they came into the series, we'll talk about David Tennant or Matt Smith, or whoever was the Doctor when they first got into Doctor Who. If we're going to be living through all of these multi-generational fandoms, franchises, whatever we want to call them, what we have to recognize is that one generation's original series is another generation's prequels. I know younger people that love the prequels because that was their Star Wars. That's the Star Wars they grew up on. Now, having said that, I don't know if Star Trek Discovery is going to be anybody's favorite Star Trek series. And that's not because of the merits or flaws of the series itself. It's because they walled it off on CBS All Access, and that was a mistake. It's, It's one app that nobody wants, that literally the night after we watched the season finale, I canceled my subscription to make sure they didn't charge me again. Because, yeah, it's a subscription I don't want to have to pay for. So, I, I don't know that it put itself into a place where it could be anybody's first Star Trek. But... It could have been its own Star Trek. And this is what's so frustrating about what's going on with Discovery. For all of their blessings and curses, good and bad, every series of Star Trek has been allowed to be itself. Deep Space Nine did not have to be a continuation of The Next Generation. And wasn't. Voyager was not a continuation of Deep Space Nine. And Enterprise was allowed to be its own kooky self until it finally found its voice and got cancelled. The problem with Discovery is 
from day one, it had its own unique voice. Season one of Discovery is an interesting show because it has its own unique voice and it has things that I would stand up for and argue for and say that it had some very good ideas there. It had some things that were bad and we've talked about those. Season two, it doubled down on what it did well and added new elements that I think made it a lot better. But through the whole thing, it acted like a codependent friend that was like, do you like me now? You were so mad when we killed off Culber. You see, it wasn't that we were killing him off. You see, we had this big thing planned and he's back and he's different and drama. I mean, you gays love the drama, right? So here's so much drama. And I, we didn't ask that he had to be brought back to life. That, that, that wasn't, that wasn't necessary. I'm, I enjoyed the way they did it. And I think his character arc is interesting, if not limited, because they didn't allow it to be on screen enough. But okay, I, I see your very clear apology for that. You, you took so much time on the Klingon homeworld to apologize for the Klingons not having hair that we see mixed into our season one Klingons, Klingons that kind of look like OG Klingons, but different enough for whatever reason. Okay. Fine. That you felt the need to do that. Whatever. But season two really, especially with the way that it ended, feels like a prolonged apology tour where they were trying to win over people who had already decided that they didn't like the show. They were not going to like the show. They were never going to like the show. But for some reason, they had to try to make it better for them. And I don't mean make it better as in actually improve the show, but like, really, look, re really, really, we listened. We hear your complaints. You want it more like OG Trek. So here's Captain Pike and here's number one and here's the Enterprise and here's Spock. And then those same people that didn't like Discovery for being different and hashtag not my Trek got mad because they didn't like how you did Pike and Spock and number one and the Enterprise. And so you see the hashtags, not my Spock and not my Pike. And you're not going to win those people over. You're just not going to do it. And you need to have the, someone in charge. This is, this is what I love about, of all the bad things I've said about Disney, this is what they got right with Star Wars. For all of the hand-wringing around The Last Jedi, it, it made them buckets of money, and they could see that it was just a small faction of people that wanted something to complain about, that found something to complain about, that complained about it, for the most part. I'm not saying everybody that had problems with it was in that camp, but a lot of people were. And they just continue doing their thing. They, they just, they're pushing on. And yeah, they're just doing what they do. And they don't care what, we, we don't see these grand apology tours. And for everybody who thinks that Rise of Skywalker is going to be that, I think you're going to be wrong when you get to the end. So, yeah. Marvel doesn't make up make apologies. It doesn't. It just moves on. Like we don't even get an explanation for why Ed Norton is no longer the Hulk. Like why did the Hulk change? Because Mark Ruffalo's playing him now. Just shut up and watch the movie. They just go forward. It just goes forward. There's this weird spinelessness, and I don't know if it's 
Kurtzman, if it's the network, I'm pretty sure it's the network, or who it is that would make them do an entire season that's nothing but saying, I'm sorry to people that are never going to like you in the first place. So, Star Trek, if you're listening to me, anybody in the writer's room, anybody at all that has any connection to the production of this show, stop apologizing. Just stop. This is what really tore Enterprise apart. They couldn't make everyone happy. And they kept trying. And they kept watering it down and watering it down and watering it down until... You can tell in season four, they just got to a point where they're like, who cares? Nobody is accepting the weird retoolings that we're doing. So let's just do the show that we want to do with the characters that we have and just run with it. And they did. And the show got really good because it gained a certain confidence because they knew that they either made it or bear or not on that season. And even though they didn't, the, some of the best episodes of the entire run are in that season. And there's not really, with the exception of the finale, a bad episode in that season. And I don't, I don't understand why Star Trek has such a desperate need to be loved. Because that's what's been hurting it for a really long time. You want to tell... You want the reason Star Trek went away for such a long time was not that the movies got bad or that people stopped caring. See, there's this myth of franchise fatigue, that there was just too much Star Trek and people just couldn't take any more. And that's why Star Trek got shelved for a really long time. That's not true. You could see it in Voyager. Voyager wasn't doing the numbers that they wanted, so they retooled Voyager and we got Seven of Nine in the beginning of Sexy Trek. Because that's a thing that they had decided to do. And it was a course correction that eventually made the series pretty good. And because... And I really feel like this is the case. Because they felt like they had listened to their audience and made changes. Because... Kess wasn't supposed to be the character that died off the show. That wasn't supposed to be what happened. It was supposed to be Harry Kim. But Garrett Wang was named the sexiest man on television by TV Guide. And, well, they couldn't kick him off the show. So they retooled everything. And he survived. And Kess left. Because she was going to have a great movie career. And definitely not go to jail for flashing kids to make them get off her lawn even though that's the thing that happened but you see this people pleasing attitude enter star trek and it just stays there and it doesn't go away and you can see it with each successive movie right star trek generations was really felt that star trek the next generation couldn't be a movie franchise on its own so it had to do this weird crossover with the original series to pass the baton for movie people because how else are people going to care about this Star Trek movie? And that made for a really bizarre movie. And so people complained and wanted it to be more, or more like itself. And then you get first contact and first contact kind of is like an episode of the of Star Trek The Next Generation, but on a super budget. And it's got the Borg and time travel and all the stuff that you've come to expect from a Star Trek series. Especially in The Next Generation. And it does okay, but, you know, we can do better. Where are the new aliens? I mean, you've already given us the Borg so many times. Why do we get the Borg again? So we get Star Trek Insurrection, and Insurrection introduces us to the Briar Patch, which is a completely different part of space that we've never talked about before, and all this other races and aliens that we've never met before, and it didn't do that well. And then Star Trek Nemesis happens, and they're like, well, kids are all about the extreme, so let's give the Enterprise crew a dune buggy and have the enemy be... An evil clone of Picard? 
for reasons of the extreme. And that's what, when you actually look at the movies and the TV series, they, like, they felt that for Enterprise to be interesting, it had to have time travel in it because they had Scott Bakula in it, and he was known for Quantum Leap. I mean, you can see that in the thought processes. And you can see that with Discovery. I mean, Discovery looks and feels like a proper show in the modern world after we got three reboot Star Trek movies. It looks and feels like what modern Star Trek looks and feels like. And that didn't make people happy. So let's retool. <laughs> like, Just stop trying to make people happy. Just try to make something good. Like, that's the entire problem that we have with Star Trek, is it desperately wants to be popular again. It desperately wants to be the biggest thing ever again. But to do that, you have to make something good. This is, this is where Marvel got it right. Iron Man had to be a great movie. It had to be a great movie. It couldn't be a mediocre movie. And it is. It's a great movie. That first Iron Man movie, Robert Towney Jr., and you watch it as they build the MCU, right? Great movie after great movie after great movie, especially for a superhero film, especially for an action movie. Just knocking it out of the park over and over and over again. And nobody wants to put the work in. This is why the DCEU didn't work, and this is why Star Trek Discovery didn't work. Season one was too much story in too little space and would have been a great season two. It would have been a wonderful season two. But we didn't know Lorca and we didn't know Giorgio and we didn't get enough time with any of the characters to really care about them for the big twist to matter. Like, if they really wanted the Tyler thing to work, we should have met Tyler before he was Klingonized. Because we find out that he was based, that, you know, there was an actual Ash Tyler. And that they used him, he was captured, and they used him to turn Voke into Tyler, and that's why they're both kind of there, and blah, 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 blah. But we didn't know him. And so, it just became an obvious plant. And Lorca came out of nowhere because we didn't know him, and it just felt like the show had gone off the rails. Because we didn't start with the Star Trek that we knew. If we started with something more familiar, and then it went off the rails because Mirror Universe Lorca replaced our Universe Lorca, then we would have seen a difference, then we would have seen a, you know something to compare it to that would have been amazing. The problem that they had with this season was again it was way too much plot the red angel plot could have been interesting and the the control plot could have been interesting but trying to mix all of those together with the weird aliens that were being hurt by the spore drive and culber's return from the dead and Klingon Gandalf and the Time Crystals and I don't even know what else. There was too much. There was too much. And it was all in service of trying, of just like throwing stuff at the wall to see what fits, if, what, what worked. And you can just tell that they've been watching people's reaction. And that's going to determine whether in season three, they just pick up in the far future and we go forward or if at the very end that light that Spock sees right the final beacon from the red angel when the seventh signal appears whether that was them returning to the beta quadrant or if that was them just saying hey we're okay and the story continuing in the far future they gave themselves an option and they're waiting to see how we react and based on how we react which version of voyager we're getting are they going to be stranded in the far future or 
Are they going to be stranded in the beta quadrant because they made a, such a big deal out about how far away they were and how far away the signal was? And honestly, I don't care. I really don't. They can do whichever they want. For goodness sakes, they can completely recast the show, give us a new ship called Discovery, and move on. Because they haven't given me time, really. I mean, I'll miss Tilly. I like Tilly. We got some time with Tilly. But we haven't really spent enough time with the characters to be really super attached to them. Because there was so much plot. <laughs> so much. And not even, like, character-specific plot. Just stuff happening, stuff happening, stuff happening. I wish there was some way that I could just get in touch with them and sit them all down and say, look, you don't have to be loved by everyone. I don't know if your parents didn't hug you enough or if the network is just such a monster that you're afraid they're going to take your show away if you're not completely and totally loved. But if you want your story to be loved, you have to love your story. You have to find something worth telling. Find a story worth telling. Find characters that are worth talking about and spending time with. And then see if we like you. Because I hate to talk about myself here, but like this is the whole thing with my work. Yeah, I want people to like it. But I have to like it because I have to spend all this time with it and do all the stuff that I do to bring it about. So... I'm more interested in writing what I believe in my heart of hearts is a good story and then hoping other people agree with me on that. And Star Trek used to have the courage to do that. You know, I do a rewatch of Star Trek every night. I watch one episode before bed and I'm now in the middle of the chain of command two-parter from um, The Next Generation. It's a wonderful episode. It's a powerful episode. It's a gripping episode. And it's based out of character. And it's based out of, you know, overarching plot themes. And so much come together to make this episode happen. And that's all you have to do. Give me characters. Give me a story that I care about. Take a risk, for goodness sakes. But build it off of the characters, because that's why we love Star Trek. It's Kirk and Spock and McCoy that we talk about. It's Picard and Data and Worf. And all of our favorite characters. It's why I still do a rewatch of Enterprise, even though it's not near my favorite show. I love Phlox. Phlox is such a good character. And I want to watch Phlox. And so I will do a, it's still in my rotation for my rewatch. Because Star Trek is about the characters. Yeah, the technology is cool and this, that, and the other. And the stories are really cool and the aliens and the fights and what have you. But we love you for your characters. So give us some and stop trying to make everybody love you. Just stop it. Anyway, sorry about that. I just had to get that off my chest because that's what I felt about it. I know I didn't talk about much about that happened in the actual episode because, well, I can sum up the episode really quickly. There was a battle and then she realizes she's the Red Angel. She sends the signals. She has a tearful goodbye with Spock and then she goes into the future and then Spock has them pass a rule that they can never talk about these events ever again. The end. And that took an hour for reasons. Anywho, if you like this episode, <laughs> I feel really weird transitioning here. If you like this episode and the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either this episode or the podcast in general, please do so. That helps me out a lot. That tells the algorithm to share me with more people. If you've got a dollar you can throw my way, please go down to the show notes. You'll see a link that says community support. If you click that, you can join the project at the one, five or $10 levels. That money helps me out a lot. It helps me do everything that I do, to be quite honest. If you don't have the money or you don't feel like giving right now, that's fine. 
just share this podcast if you think you know somebody that will enjoy it. Yeah, speaking of enjoy it, have you checked out Mask of the Gods yet? If you like listening to me talk about all these things, you can see how I actually do telling my own story over there. Just head over to maskofthegods.com or search your favorite podcasting app. I should hopefully be in there. If you want to ask me a question or anything, C.E. Dorset on Twitter. You can go to projectshadow.com and find links to all my social media. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, until next time, love yourself and don't try to get everybody to love you. And have the fun. Bye.